Positive Filter with your host, Philip Wilkerson, a podcast that focuses on friends, family, health, and career with a little self-help around the way. Please join me in this journey for self-improvement, and I hope that what I have to share will make you a better person, thus making the world a better place. Hey, Positive Filter listeners, uh, it's Philip Wilkerson, a.k.a. Ill Phil, a.k.a. the Prince of Positivity, a.k.a. I uh, got Austin, Texas on my leg, a tattoo, and I'm back again <laughs> with another episode of Positive Filter. Um, as you know, I get many, multiple, amazing guests on my podcast, and today is no different. I am joined by uh, John Hollis. Now, John, uh, we met uh, through our work here. And uh, at the university, which is unnamed, okay, if you Google me, you'll know where I work. Um, but we, we, you know, uh, we're just talking, chopping it up. And John has an amazing story that I think I uh, wanted to share with the listeners. So before I even get started, let me introduce uh, my guest. So, John, go ahead and introduce yourself. Uh, well, for, first of all, Phil, it's a pleasure being here. Thank you very much for having me. Um, uh, like you said, I've, I'm an author. I've been a sports writer most of my professional life. I think I've got uh, 17 years of daily newspaper experience, including more than almost 10 at the Atlanta Journal Constitution. But uh, really here to talk about my book, Sergeant Rodney M. Davis: The Making of a Hero. It, it's the life and s- story and about the life, death, and tragic inspiration of the life and death, rather, of Sergeant Rodney M. Davis, who is making Georgia's lone Medal of Honor recipient, Marine from Vietnam era, and he also happens to be my wife's uh, pl- uncle. Plug, plug, plug is an amazing book. And so definitely uh, before you, we talk about the book, let's, you know, get, obviously I'm going to ask you to give a brief synopsis. But I mainly want to talk about uh, for the listeners of this podcast more about your journey as a writer, uh, particularly you said over 17 years in journalism. But then the different venture, whether, you know, since you've had all this experience writing journalism, what made that transition uh, to becoming a, a book author, specifically, particularly with this story? So g- go ahead and give a brief synopsis of the book. Sure. Uh, basically, the story is about Sergeant Rodney M. Davis. He's a, one of 200 Marines who was on a patrol in September of 1967 near the DMZ in South Vietnam. They walked into an MVA trap set by 2,500 MV, North Vietnamese Army soldiers who were waiting for them. And they were overrun, obviously. It was a bad day. A lot of, a lot of Marines were wounded and killed. Um, a hand grenade landed in the trench Sergeant Davis was sharing with five other Marines. Mm-hmm. There was so much noise and shooting everywhere. The other Marines in that trench with them did not see it. Sergeant Davis did see it, jumped on that grenade, pulled it underneath himself with both hands, took the entire blast, was killed to save the lives of those five Marines. He was African-American. They were white. And that was a big detail given in 1967. More than 150 American cities had race riots. Sergeant Davis was from Macon, Georgia, where Jim Crow was still the law of the land. Right. But the irony is, 10,000 miles away, the closest thing to hell on earth, those guys had it right. Didn't matter what color you were. Didn't matter what your daddy did, where you were from. They are young Americans spilling the same blood in the same mud. Yeah, so it's a very deep story. Uh, patriotism obviously has a lot of connection to now. Um, we do acknowledge that. You know, while racism and all these terrible things exist, uh, when we have a shared goal, particularly the military or any other thing, um, obviously can transcend race, uh, especially if you're, you got your lives on the line and, and they become a true brotherhood. You know, my dad served in the military and I'm pretty sure that he white, black and other. He has people that he would call his brothers bleed the same uh, color red. Yeah. And obviously lay their life on the line for people, regardless of their color, because, you know, like at the end of the day, everyone just want to come home from a war. You know what I'm saying? Like you, they got all have families and they got kids and wives and cousins and nieces and nephews. And, you know, while they may be uh, dealing with all the stuff back home at that moment in time when they're in another country, they had to, to rely on each other and, and, and band together. So uh, this is an amazing story, and I definitely think you know we're gonna put the book uh, book in the show notes so that people can purchase the book. But I want to you know we're gonna go back back in time yep. to your journey as a, a writer. Um, start off at the beginning of your journey. Um, when did you start getting into writing and journalism and all that stuff? It's funny. I graduated from the University of Virginia. I was a political science major. Had okay. never worked for a newspaper in my life. And not even a school paper. Not even a school paper. Okay. But I just knew I loved sports. I played sports my entire life. I, yeah. loved, I was a good writer. I did know that. Yeah. And I just said, you want know let me try this sports writing thing. And I got a job as a sports writer. Literally my, that simple. 
So I mean, did, did you Pure write? Luck. Did you write about like when you were playing sports? Did you just write like about what you did? Like how? No. How do you never. know you like to write about sports? And how do you know you were a good writer? I was a political science major. At UVA, you do a yeah. lot of writing. So you did a lot of writing science. in class, right? And then how did you know you wanted to transfer and say, "I'm gonna talk about how many buckets this dude dropped and all that stuff." Just, just appealed to me. I mean, just you know, just yeah. I don't know, just kind of. Just it's your interest, w- right? You're passionate about sports. You're a good writer. It just seemed like a natural, natural fit. Okay, well, you know, this is I'm gonna go on tangent. I'm gonna just let you know right now. I go on <laughs> random tangents. Some of my questions are prepared. Some are not. What sport do you like writing about the most? I was always a basketball guy. Okay, you like the ba- you like my, to write about my ball. passion. I played it, love it, watch yeah. it all the time. And as you know, he's pretty tall, y'all. You can't see that visual because that's not a visual podcast. <laughs> now, so you, you you said you just by happenstance luck. What was your first uh, sports writing job? I worked um, in my hometown newspaper, for, like the, Fre- the Freelance Star in Fredericksburg, Virginia. I literally walked into the interview, had no experience. Just just basically selling yourself, and the guy yeah. hired me as a part-time job, like thirty hours a week. I okay. was there for about a year, and they got me. A, they hired. They I did. A, I thought I did a pretty good job, and they went and found me a full-time job with the Potomac News in Woodbridge. Okay, Woodbridge. And what sports were you writing in, in that? I started area? out covering high school. The first year, okay, high, high school. So that's kind of everybody starts out. You start, yeah. out, you know, paying your making your bones, paying your dues, and then when after two years, I was covering college UVA football games and covering the Redskins okay. for them. So you did the so you would cover the the local DMV sports. Mm-hmm. Now you're you were located in um Fredericksburgish area. Did you have to drive to Charlottesville to take the, to do the sports or yeah. how did that work? To go cover games at UVA, you you had to drive to go cover the games and then go back home. Right. I'd file my story at UVA. How far was the drive? Uh, maybe an hour and ten minutes. Okay, that's not that bad. Boom, yeah, just Fredericksburg, go there, write a thing about what they're doing, go back, and then same way, like Fredericksburg up to DC right. for the, uh, the Redskins. Redskins. Well, I was in the, yeah, I was in Woodbridge then, and we're, and this when the skins were still at RFK. Yep. Okay. Yep. So bet. I spent like th- a better part of almost three years as covering the Redskins for them. So I've covered you know the playoffs, covered the Super Bowl, got a little, little bit of everything. Ninety one Super Bowl. Nope. There's ninety. I covered the ninety six Super Bowl out in, in Arizona, Phoenix Steelers, Cowboys. Okay. Trash. First of all, I'm a Steelers yeah. fan, so uh, watch it. No, Steelers is good. I got love and respect for the Steelers. I'm talking about the Cowboys. They trash. Actually, they're not. Um, they're better. But I'm a Redskins fan. You know, heart. Um, unfortunately, so you you were doing that, man. You, you're covering sports. You're getting in the locker rooms, getting interviews and stuff. Yep. Uh, you went to the Black Mecca, as they say. Uh, how did you yep. transition from there to Atlanta? Um, basically, I got you know at the Potomac News. I also covered the Olympics in the same year, '96. I covered mm-hmm. the Super Bowl and I covered the Olympics. It's by, by far the best year professionally <laughs> probably yes. ever had. Because anytime yes. you get two, two of those, I mean, in the same yeah. year, I went to the Olympics. Oh, uh, you okay? Well, I mean, I'm a military brat, so we we went to the Olympics. That was a big deal. You it know? was. You talking be, about the Atlanta Olympics? Yeah, that was okay. dope. I remember getting the little pins. Yeah. And I it was crowded. It was hot. Basketball. It was, it was hot. Uh, you know, remember the people used to share the pins, mm-hmm. and then we watched some events. So you covered some events. That's I covered uh, swimming and diving mostly. That's and big. I went And went to a lot of men's basketball as well. Oh, um, nice. That's the, the dream team. It was a dream team. Two. Dream yeah, team two. Three. 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 Two was in 94, the World Championships. Yes, okay. And, so you uh, covered but, that. That's So dope. we, had, you know, from Woodbridge, from Potomac, Potomac News, we had some local guys. David Robinson, of course, went to Osborne Park High School in Manassas. And went to Naval Academy. And he went to Naval Academy. Grant Hills from Reston. I knew his, his high school coach was coaching at Osborne Park at that time. Flint Hill. Mm-hmm. No, he okay. went to uh, South Lakes, actually. South Lakes, South that's Lakes. right. Okay. And so, of course, they wanted me to do something on those guys. I I met them before and knew them both anyway. So yes. the two weeks before the Olympics, here's the best assignment I ever had. They sent me you – know, I knew the Olympics were going to be a zoo, trying to talk to anybody with yes. all the people there. So the Pacific News sent me to Chicago, to Moody Bible Institute. I went to the Dream Team training camp for a week. Oh, Got nice. Got to dance, see those guys and talk to those guys one-on-one the entire – Entire week. That's dope. Best basketball I've ever seen in my life. They, they, they do drills three on two, four on three, shoot free throws first hour. Last hour of each day for five days, they sent the refs home, played pickup basketball. Best basketball I've ever seen in my life. Did you try to jump in? I wish. <laughs> Look, no. I would have been so out of my league. You would have got dunked on. Oh, man. yeah. That, was, that, that front line, that, their centers were David Robinson, Hakeem Olajuwon, and a young Shaquille O'Neal. It was ridiculous how much talent oh, they had. wow. Okay. So you're doing that. And I, like I said, uh, when we met uh, – couple months ago man you were just dropping i mean dropping names like people we look up to um and you were covering the sports and writing about them and you meet all these people them, i mean yeah you get to, get to, you hum- get to know them but you humanize them because right. you were like man that's just my man's i i, right. I, I talked to him um you spend more time with them during the season almost than you do with your own families and vice right. versa right you see them on the road you see them at practice every day you see them at games every day you get to know their families they get to know your family i mean you know each other through and through now, so you did the covering of that Olympics. And, and I was also in Centennial Park when the bomb went off in, in the Olympics as well. 
Did you write about that? I did. I won a slew of Virginia Press Association awards. Sheesh. So you just okay, you're saying like you're just in the right place in the right time. That was just random luck. I, I mean, and I walked by that very spot twenty minutes earlier with four friends of mine from UVA who were staying with me. And we were out having a good time and just the grace of God. We were in the park when it went off. Oh, and I won what? every Virginia Press I won a slew of Virginia Press Association awards basically because I was the only reporter there when it and happened. You, and you wrote. And I wrote about it. Oh uh, so uh before cell phones, do you have like a, did you have like a little pad in your, pa- in your I just, pocket? I had, just happened to have come from a press conference, a swimming press conference that ended at six o'clock. Yeah. And I had met my friends down there in, De- in Centennial Park by six thirty. Yeah. So I hadn't gone back, you know, left, you know, I had all my stuff still with me, notepad and pens, all that stuff just happened okay. to be on me. Yeah. So you just carry stuff to write. I mean, now we got the phone and right. we do interviews. You, you just hold, you know, you do a little memo thing. For right. Back in the day, did you just have a piece of paper? With I just you? had a notepad in my pocket. It just happened, you know, like I said I still, still had. It. So I talked to people right then and there. Talked. Please talk to victims. Yes, yes. So all the carnage up close. I mean, it was crazy. It was the craziest no. night of my life. So with that, you're in there. You're you're making connections. What made you decide of all media markets? I want to move to Atlanta. Um, well, actually, because of that, that notoriety for doing all those stories from the bomb. Of course, that gets you know gets your name out there. Yes. And then four, three, four months later, I got a job offer from CNN, and so that's how I first moved to Atlanta. I went to CNN. Was there for about maybe almost a year. Didn't really like it what I was doing. Then I went to the Gainesville. Moved. I got a job offer from the Gainesville Sun in Florida. Okay. And I was there for three years, being as a lead writer for the you know, covering the University of Florida men's basketball team. The the Gators. Right. Who was and there while you were there? Billy Donovan, Jason Jason okay. Williams, Mike yeah, Miller, yeah. Udonis yeah. Haslam, Donnell okay. Harvey. So you're there and during people. I was okay. the lead basketball writer, so I went to every game, home and away, went to every practice, every last day, everywhere, went all over the country with them to write about them. Basketball. Every game, everywhere. I remember the last year I was there. We had games in Maui. We had games in New York, Chicago. Traveling. I mean, all over the country. I mean, it was, it was insane. It was absolutely insane. So then you're doing that, and then when did you go back to Atlanta? Uh, at the end of my third year at the game, in Gainesville, Florida, the Atlanta Journal-Constitution offered me a job. That's crazy. And I moved up to Atlanta. The first year I was a, I was a general assignment guy. I was a backup Hawks. I covered Hawks. I covered like 40 game, Hawks games that year. I covered yeah. college football, Georgia, and Georgia Tech. Yeah. Then after that, they moved me to the, as the Georgia Tech beat writer for the next six years. Went to, I covered football and men's basketball for Georgia Tech. So I went to every game for football and men's basketball for Georgia Tech sports. That's nutty. So that's crazy. And and this is a crazy journey. And then, you know, fast forward, whatever, you're now here in the DMV. Yep. Um, and you love Spire Sports. But I, I definitely want to talk about your journey uh, and give a lot of large portion of this episode to your journey about writing this book. So you've done multiple years of journalism, sports, sports, sports. Take us through, or the, uh, the listeners, take us through the process of going from sports to writing this very powerful story about um, – uh, Sergeant Davis. Davis, thank well, you. Well, at least the thing for me is, like, as a writer, you never want to be pigeonholed. I was yes. always very self conscious about that from day one. I was the kind of guy, I love sports, but I love politics too. From day I was, like I said, I was a political science major at UVA. Yeah. I, could, I love politics. And there are a lot of sports guys who are typecast and they can only do sports. And I like yeah. to take a lot of pride in myself in being very versatile yeah. and being able to do anything. So I've always been able to believe that any good writer. Can write about anything. Yeah. If you know, given the basic background, like, you know, if you ask me like a physics uh, piece Dang. tomorrow, it might may take me take me a while to do the well, background. You, maybe on you'll it. just interview the physicist. Right. Exactly. Uh, say that right, physicist. Exactly. But so if you, you, but you're also I, I'm also going to assume that your transition skills, uh, whether you you don't have that subject area content, you you're you amazing, ask questions. You're a good interviewer too. Yeah, I, 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 like I mean, I you have talked to so many people and yep. learn how to ask good questions. You ask good questions yeah. and you, you know you do you do your homework before your interviews. Yeah, okay. you know and True. stuff like that. And like for me also the transition started earlier. My I think it was like 2004, 2005, I started writing for Time magazine. I was their okay. correspondent for them in Atlanta. And I think for the entire 7 years I was a correspondent for them. I only did one sports story. The rest were political stories, social stories, okay. just you name it. So Other you know, stories. they're really kind of yeah, right. So you know, you want to show your get your bona fides, show you can do more than just sports as well. Okay. And and of course you work for places like the AJC, you work for like places like the Time magazine. Of course, people tend to talk to you a little bit more. You know, yes. they would turn your phone call when you, you say you're calling for Time Magazine. You're calling from Atlanta. You journal, name drop. Journal, you, you brand drop. You, you know do. what I'm saying? Like, and they would turn your phone call a lot more. Like, they say you put them in news. Hi, this is John Hollis. I, I'm not going to answer you. Hi, this is John Hollis from Time Magazine. They'll okay, call you I got back. you. They call you back. <laughs> and so, of course, that it's, opens up a lot of other doors as yeah, well. Yeah, you stun on them. People come to you all of a sudden, hey, we, we think it's a great story. We'd be interested in doing this. So yes. it kind of snowballs on itself a little bit, too. Right. Saying. Okay, so you're doing that. 
yeah, let's. You're, you're, I'm not pigeonholed. I can write about everything. Bring us through this story. Sure. Like, what made you like? I met my wife, and we were still dating. And she knew I was. I was always loved American history. My mom was an American history high school teacher, so I always okay. grew up with a deep affinity for American history. Yeah, that's my major in college. Okay, too. I'm, Shout I'm out. right there I with love, you, man. I love history. And uh, so, of course, we were dating, and she told me about her uncle. She's like, my uncle was. With a Medal of Honor recipient. Mm-hmm. He was killed when he jumped on a grenade um, mm-hmm. during the Vietnam War. I thought that was fascinating. Yes. It wasn't until years later, I, I, you know, I, I was toward the end of my time at the AJC. It's like I decided this is a great story. Let me look into it and start de- you know, digging yeah. around. And, of course, as a journalist, I'm trained to find information. I know how to yeah. find information. Yeah. I know where to get information, most importantly. If, yes. You know, yes. And know who to talk to. If I, if, I, you know, if I don't have access to it, I can find somebody who does. Boom, boom, boom. So, like, with like what do you mean, like, access? Like, first start with the public library? Uh, look then at you some, start out the Internet, basic research. But then, uh, you yeah. know, like for this, for example, I know people at the Pentagon. There you go. Okay. And so I know people at the Pentagon. And I put out word about, you know, I found out that all five of those guys, my, my wife's family didn't even know that all five of the Marines he saved were white. Because the Marines oh, issue release just said, said he saved five Marines. That, yes. You know, they don't, Marines, the only, only color they care about is Marine Green. Yes, exactly. Semper Fi, right? Exactly. Care. So it, in the release, it doesn't say five white Marines. It just says five Marines. So, so you th- found their for names. For decades, yeah. what I did, but for decades, the Davis family had assumed that at least one or some of those Marines were African American. Wow. I just seen the look on their faces when I told them. I waited to the family reunion to tell them all. They what, were what, dumbfounded. Because so, Jim Crow was still the law of the land. Okay, so, so those same Marines that he, was, he, was, he saved, if he had brought back to Macon, Georgia, he wouldn't even been allowed to eat in the same restaurant with them. Okay, so let's say you, you started this in 2005? No, I started this project probably in 2010. Not, 2010. When did you find out they were all white dudes? 2015. I confirmed, before I told anybody, I confirmed it. So you found out five years later they're all white dudes? I yeah, I didn't realize it until uh, later. I need to confirm it. I, you know, I thought, you know, after the after the third goes, those guys who survived, I wanted to talk to them in person. Okay, great. And because uh, those kind of interviews you have to do in person. Right. But after the third one, like, oh my gosh, they're all white. Wow. And then it's like, uh, quite honestly, this sounds terrible. But after the talk to the fourth one, I saw a picture of him. He had passed away, but I saw a picture of him. I was like, oh my gosh, four of them are white. And I, was, and I finally met the fifth guy. I was almost going to be disappointed <laughs> if he, he was. Yeah. I mean, it's still been a great story, even if he, yeah. if he wasn't. But well, the fact that all five, five yeah, right. Three out of five. That's still pretty good. But the fact that all five of them were white it was incredible detail. And you said, okay, you you were able to find how many still living? Three, uh, four of the five were still alive. Four of the five. And they were local? Or where were they? They were all over the country. So but you them, went to them? Um, most of them. Yeah, they were, they were coming in various things. They were like, they have various marine events or whatever, and so I try to you know make it locally. But yeah, I, I went to them, talked to them in person. Wow! And the Marine Corps is fantastic. Uh, I put out word who I, what I was doing in, in, in DC. I know a lot of people in DC. Yeah. And I got invited to the Pentagon uh, maybe f- five years ago to do a PowerPoint presentation in front of three generals and two colonels. Okay. And they knew who Sergeant Rodney M. Davis was because you know there's a I don't know if you've been to the Pentagon, but there's a thing wow. at the, ba- in the in the basement called the Hall of Heroes. Well, I need to go now because my dad used to work there. Get your so dad I'll, to take you. I'll get my there's dad. There's a Hall to take of me. Heroes down there. They got a name name of every medal, U.S. Medal of Honor recipient in our nation's history okay. down there in the Hall of Heroes. I have to go down. So of course the generals I talked to, they knew who Sergeant Davis' name was. Plus they knew I was coming, so they knew his name, but they did not know the black white thing until I told them. Wow. I mean, Phil, I could, you could see their mind, the grinding of their minds. When they, wow. they saw, as I was talking, I, I did about a 45-minute presentation, and I could see their minds grinding because they could see, what you know, given everything that's going on today, given that racial tensions are again spiking here in the U.S., yeah. given that U.S. military members of all races and colors and sexes are fighting to, beside one another overseas right now, is every bit is relevant today as it was in 1967. Probably magnified back exactly. then. Exactly. I mean, like you said, like they couldn't even, he come home. I think that one of the biggest things I ever learned from that when I studied history and what I felt bad for is that, uh, like, you know, my grandfather, he was a veteran of World War II, and it was just so sad. Like, he would do this, and then he'd come home, and he was just, you know, part of my language, just another nigger. You know what I'm yep. saying? And that's yep. what they would say, you know? And uh, and th- I found that, I always found that, that, that piece so upsetting, you know, um, that these people... Uh, our, our my grandfathers and all uh, and other people literally died for this country, and they would come home and they couldn't even like you said they couldn't even eat it's lunch crazy. or they couldn't even like you know get a you know they had to walk and instead of taking the bus and you know we uh, I you know the what was this some stories you know like dude would come home with his uniform and say the wrong thing and get yep. lynched I'm like yep. come on now that's crazy it is crazy but it if we could take the lessons I, I you know I don't you know obviously think war is the best thing you know it's like let's go to war so we can band together but you know i think there's a lot of a lot to say about when people are faced with really like life or like life or death combat life or death situations uh human instinct takes over rather than um 
physical. So, yeah. like, you know, when you're faced with life or death, um, you don't care what color guy yeah. is next to you. You yes. don't care what he calls God, yeah. calls God, where he's from, what his daddy does, as long as he's got your six. That's yes. all you yeah, care about. Yeah, I totally agree with that. Or, like, um, we just all want to go home. Uh, or things like, uh, you know, at this moment, um, now this person, we – like we have a deep, they have a deeper friendship, like and a deeper friendship and bond than probably some of their friends from exactly. back home, their high school buddies, because they probably you know cried, you know, yep. cried together, bled together, bled cried together, together. Um, saw guys die together, saw other people die together. So, I just found that so interesting. I think of that, like I think your story, I think of so many stories, you know, like you, know, you watch, you know, Tuskegee Airmen and all that stuff. Uh, you know, when I say t- I'm randomly thinking about Tuskegee Airmen, where they literally were saving bombers, right? You know, they're flying, and they literally made it a mission to make sure that no bomber, you know, went down. And these black dudes are saving all these white bomber pilots, you know? Um, I just find that so fascinating. I wish that we could take lessons from the military like that without having to go to war, if that makes sense. You know, like, to a lesser degree, we yeah. do in sports. Sports yes. is the same sort of yes. thing. We yes. have people from different races, different backgrounds, different socioeconomic backgrounds, yeah. you know, personal experiences coming together, working toward a common goal. Yeah. That's that's the common link right there. Yeah, and I think that uh, when I was reading the thing, uh, um, I think it was a New York Times thing about friendship, and I think that social justice and all those things are, you know, transcended by um combat in sports like even uh bob cousy was said like one of his biggest regrets in his friendship with um bill russell was that like on the court he was my brother and he wished that you know in hindsight he would have been more vocal about civil rights off the court because he's like on the court this dude is my legit ride or die so i wish i could have transformed that camaraderie um and and there is instances where people have transcended that camaraderie like some some veterans some white veterans will come home and be like yo i definitely don't like what's going on with my black brothers because he is my brother like you don't know what he did he saved my life right did you get a sense and then this is a roundabout question did you get a sense that some of these white gentlemen their lives were transformed by this like maybe they came home and they're like you know nope. what i'm never using the word i'm never using the n-word again no question uh, about I'm, it. I'm never um if a guy wants to sit next to me and he black, I don't care. Like, nope. did, no did, question. Did, some of that, did, yep. did they share some of those stories? Nope, they did. And all these guys were amazing. That was the hardest part for me, getting to know these guys, because I didn't serve with them. They were all older than me. They served in Vietnam. They're older yeah. than me. I didn't serve with them. So for them to welcome me and trust me with those stories, I mean, that's something I'll always honor, yeah. be honored, and treasure the rest of my life. But, I mean, they told me all, all their, the, every detail you can think of. It was the hardest interviews I've ever done. But to each one of those five survivors, they all went out and lived bountiful lives, great lives. I detailed yes. my last chapter of the book, I detail each of them have done the last 50 years. Yes. Jobs, kids, grandkids. One of them, the platoon sergeant, is to Sergeant Davis' has left. He's now a retired millionaire, just had his fifth great grandchild last year. Wow. The platoon commander is to his right. He had curled into a ball expecting to die, thinking, to, you know, because he lost track of the grenade. He died of natural causes three, three or four years ago. Yeah. But his grandson, his oldest grandson, is now an active duty captain in the U.S. Marine Corps. Yeah. I was at, OC, at his graduation at OCS at Quantico to watch him gr- get his gold bars, become a Marine Corps officer. Right. It wasn't a dry. I, I cried. He cried. And he went to the picture of Sergeant Rodney M. Davis at the National Museum of the Marine Corps, did his ceremonial first salute to the picture of Rodney Davis. Wow. It is, it's amazing. So they did take some lessons. Did All anyone, of them did. Did, they, did anyone share an actual concrete story of, like, I went home and uh, I saw a black person and, you know, I had a totally different instinct. Yeah, they or, did. Uh, I mean, they, they'd never been around black people on a daily yes. basis before. None of them. Like, the platoon yes. commanders are 22-year-old from Texas in 1967. Okay? Yes, how, right. how, how How liberal do you think he was? Nah, not exactly. Not, right. Right. And, right. And likewise, Sergeant Davis had never been around white people on a daily basis before. Right. But that was the beauty of the whole story. They came together. They realized they had the same hopes. The same fears, the same dreams, and you bleed the same color red. All the same kind of people. Yeah, yeah and they came home. And then, like, obviously, they were able to, um, I think, like, learn lessons. Like, I, I say that all the time. It's like you never know that, you know, butterfly effect. Like, he probably was just saving his friends. He didn't know that. Well, the, 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 that, you, you know. touch on a point, though. Sergeant Davis, as I mentioned, he grew up grew up in the Jim Crow South. Okay? Yes. He was the second oldest of five kids in, in his home in Macon. Yeah. And because Jim, you know, the threat of Jim Crow meant that every time he went outside the house, the threat of violence yes. or humiliation was real yes. every time he stepped foot outside the house. So because of that, his parents instilled in them from a young age, you always look after your brothers and sisters. He had four brothers, mm-hmm. three other brothers, and, and a sister, so there were five right. kids. And so looking out for his brothers was when he was 
ingrained to do at a young age. Yeah. He died as he lived, looking out for his new brothers in the U.S. Marine Corps. Yeah, exactly. That's crazy. So you're doing all this research. You're getting access to information. And the Pentagon gave me, before I, excuse me, yeah, interrupt yeah. you, but That's as I was right. leaving the Pentagon for the PowerPoint presentation, I told them, everything I just told you, I told them. I had not got back into my back to my car yet in the parking lot of the Pentagon. I've been CC'd from an email from a lieutenant general, three-star general, to the Pentagon's chief archivist and chief historian. Yes. I always have everything the Pentagon had on Sergeant Rodney Davis. The Pentagon gave me declassified action reports, his military records, everything. They gave me more stuff about him than I could ever hope to use. All the paperwork from the entire Medal of Honor investigation, everything. Wow. So you have, that's what I'm saying, that's the records. Everything. Now, where did you, uh, you start writing and you mm-hmm. got down, you start researching. When did you actually... Between the time of learning the story, put a uh, pen to pad. Like, when did you start typing? I did a lot of research first. Because yeah. the thing about, you know, as a writer, you learn, you never know where your research is going to take you. Yes. You know, so you do your research and, you, you know, your writing may go somewhere different after you, you, you find something out in the research. So, like, for me, I had no idea that all five of those, white, those Marines were white until I yeah. did the research. Okay. It totally changes everything. Yes. That totally changes where, where you're going with that story. Because then, you, you, then you, you have a chapter describing the... Uh, like the social, the social scene, what's going on in America. You describe the race riots going on in America. Yes. You know, Thurgood Marshall, six days before Sergeant Davis was killed, Thurgood Marshall became the first African-American confirmed to the U.S. Supreme Court. Shout August out to Frat, you know what I'm saying? He yeah, too, August you know. 31st. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, but that was after 20 U.S. senators did not vote. Can you imagine wow. a U.S. Supreme Court justice being confirmed and one-fifth of the U.S. Senate refuses to vote? They wow. made, made plans to be out of town or whatever because they didn't want to anger their, their constituents. Wow. That's Can you sh- imagine that? That's, that's, that's kind of arm, that, arm wrangling that Linda B. Johnson had to do to get him in there. That was the back, hand, that was the back context. Yep. But that's how, how bad race relations were at that time. And so, you know, for me, it was, it was just incredible just doing all the writing. Uh-huh. And then, um, and then, then once you, you go one down one road and things lead to, a, lead to another. As I was yes. leaving the Pentagon after that powerful presentation, one of the generals said, John, have you ever been to the ship? In 1987, the Navy commissioned the USS Rodney M. Davis. It was the first U.S. Navy warship named after an African-American Medal of Honor recipient. Wow, okay. There have been other ships. There were like supply ships that have been named after African-Americans. But, but there was the first warship named after an African-American Medal of Honor recipient. Wow. And so I said, of course, I know, sir, I had not. And the Davis family had been there in 1987 when it was commissioned. But this was, a, this was again, this was in 2012. And so they arranged for me to take my wife and my son to Naval Station Everett. I was like 20 miles north of Seattle. Seattle, okay, gotcha. And we got there. I figured we'd just meet the captain, just go on board a ship. We get there, all 110 members of the crew and all the senior officers, including the captain, out in their dress whites on the flight deck waiting for us, right? We had a red carpet for us to come aboard. As we came aboard, somebody started ringing the bell, and the PA announcer goes, Davis family boarding, Davis family boarding, and they all snapped to attention, every last one of them. I get goosebumps talking about that now. Okay, did they? Did his My fam- wife just started crying. Did his family even, did, did Miss, you know, Mr. Davis, Sergeant Davis, did his family even know how, like, amazing this was? Like, they, like, is it one of those things where you're like, you know, like, you could be like the all-star basketball player or whatever, and then you just go home and like, you're just that dude, and no one knows that you're I, the man? Or like, how, did they know he's the man? Like, did they know this? They, I mean, they, they're, I mean, I, I will just say this, they my wife had this discussion because she says because I'm a journalist, I like to ask questions. And I, my thing is, like, if that had been my brother, of course you would have you know, it would have knocked you to your knees for six months or eight months or whatever. Yeah. But after a few months, after a year or so, I would have wanted to ask questions. I would have wanted to know what happened to my brother. Who was there? I would have wanted to talk yes. to somebody who was there when it happened. Yes. Just for closure's sake for myself. Yeah. But they didn't. And that, the Davis family did not do that. So they just like literally did not like go deeper and like realize nope. this impact and this dude had and right. this tree that grew out from him and all these right. famous all people, these people and right. all that stuff. I mean, it's crazy. It was crazy. That's nuts. And so I, you know, that's the part of satisfaction it's given me, bringing that story to life. And nothing ever replaces the loss of a loved loved one, especially right. at age twenty five. Right. But for them to know that he was heroic, that his mm-hmm. his gift of life continues to this day. Right. So that that gives me a great pride. It's impact. He had yeah. an impact beyond himself. Exactly. Now you you getting all this research. You you putting pen to pad. You're writing. I'm pretty sure that if you could, you could do a volume like volumes like one, two, three. How did you realize what to trim down and say this is applicable to a book? Because I'm I would probably be quite honest on my side. I'd probably have a hard time saying what's relevant and that, not relevant. I mean that is a challenge. You got to make sure you don't you know get stuck in the weeds too much. Yeah. Um, but it, 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 I don't know. I, I guess I just have news judgment from all those years being a, a writer. You have right. news judgment, so you kind of kind of know what's important and what's not. Um, but as I was saying, you know, so many things led to another. After going to the Pentagon, 
And, of course, then I called the, you know, he, he was, like I said, he was killed in September of 67. In March of 69, President Nixon had brought the whole Davis family up from Macon to the White House, presented the Medal of Honor. Mm. So, of course, you know, as a journalist, I know what to do there. You call the White House communication staff. You talk oh, to the White House man. communication staff. Hey, can I get pictures, transcripts, everything of their visit? And the White House was fantastic. They were, went, bent over backwards to give me everything I needed, pictures, transcripts, everything. So then about maybe three years after that, that was probably in 2011, I talked, first talked to the White House. So in 2014, um, late 2014, I got this phone call out of the blue from the White House. I hadn't talked to anybody there in three years. So obviously they keep pretty good notes or every phone call. They were yeah. telling me that President Obama was having a Medal of Honor ceremony. Would I like to attend? Of course. Yes. <laughs> Let me get back to you. No. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I think we'll, yeah. I think we'll I don't be there. care what I'm doing. I'm doesn't going matter on. what you're doing. You drop what you're doing. And you make it. So oh. I was literally in the White House in each room, eight feet from President Obama, sitting right behind the Joint Chiefs of Staff, watching him present the Medal of Honor. Most amazing thing I've ever done in my life. This ever. is crazy. That like literally this this book and this journey for you has like never not saying, a million not saying years. open doors but it's like literally brought you to so many different places you didn't really went like you were like i'm gonna write a book about my family member and because of that now you've been seeing o- president obama you met all these generals yep. like it, it spiraled beyond it, you have you ever just took a look back and be like dang this is crazy like how it, does how did this book translate to this never in a million years i mean i've told my, a lot of my friends the same thing never in a million years when i started on this journey this path that I could have envisioned. It would have taken me to the places it's been. And the best part, like three years ago, I was finishing the book up. I'd gone back and forth from Atlanta, come back up here to Quantico, Marine Corps Base Quantico, because that's yeah. where the Marine Corps Historical Division is. And, of course, somebody had told the base commander, the colonel, now he's Lieutenant General David Maxwell, but it was Colonel David Maxwell at the time. Somebody had told him about the story. So he wanted to meet me, his base commander. And so we had met and talked, and I told him the story. And, of course, there's a story that strikes the heart of every Marine. They, they, you know, they, they t- Marines take care of their own. You're right. They offered me a job in public affairs in Marine Corps Base Quantico. Like, so I had credentials. I could stay there, you know, work at Quantico in public affairs office. I could go back and forth to the historical division and Quant- the Pentagon and get any other information I needed. Yeah. So that was great. For like a couple months, I was, I was up there th- throughout the week. They took me out to the gun range like three times a week. I got to do wow. combat, virtual combat training with the Marines. Spent a day out in the field with a scout sniper team. Met three Medal of Honor recipients. It was the most amazing experience ever. I mean, right. ever. So you're le- learning and all this stuff. Did it ever make you want to go in the military? No, I mean, was, <laughs> at 22 years no. old, there was no going in the military. No, man, I, mean, I, I look at my dad's life and his career, and I'm like, hell no, I don't. I tip my hat to those guys, that's for sure, but it wasn't years. for me. No, it wasn't for me either. I wanted to be stay put. So you're doing all this, you're writing, you're, you're, you're. When you got to the final edit, um, and you sent it off to your editors, right? Did you ever get some feedback where they told you some things and you were like, man, no, I got to keep this in the story. I got to keep this um, in the book. Sometimes. I mean, but, you know, again, you're a writer. You're used to getting your stuff edited. And yes. I have no problem. If the edit made it made it better and I could see that it made it better, yes. I had no problem with you that. You were able to But I did fight that. back on some edits because, you, know, yeah. you know, sometimes quantity doesn't make it better. Or if you take, you're not taking on as a key and key. You know, piece of information we need to have. What was one thing that you said I had to have this in the book? And um, they kind of give you a little bit of pushback, like an aspect of the book. Maybe it was a chapter or a personal story about. I, I would say they wanted me to trim down some on some of the. Uh, I know, yeah, they wanted me to trim down on some of the racial elements because I, I described what Bacon was like in great detail before Sergeant as he yes. was growing up. Yes, you know, because you wanted to experience what he's going through. Yes, because that makes what he did for five white guys. He had, he only been in country three weeks, by the way. When he was killed, three weeks. Three weeks. But hold up, okay, three so, weeks. But did he go to boot camp with the dude? No, he went, No, he was. In, he was. He had went to Vietnam. He went to enlisted the Marine Corps in 1961. Okay, and by and then by six, from 64 to 67, he was a U.S. Marine Embassy guard in London. Okay, got he it. He volunteered for duty in Vietnam. Okay. Arrived in Vietnam on August 14th, 1967. He was killed on September 6th. How long did he have? But how long did he have to to get to know the guys that he sacrificed? Like I said, he only been in ta- been in country three weeks. One of the he guys knew, he knew the guys for three weeks. One of the guys, Jeez. one of the guys who beside him had been in the hospital with malaria till the day before, so he'd never even been met. Just only throughout the chaos of combat, they end up you know yeah they yeah end up beside each other. He had never been introduced, never as much as said one word to him. And oh my goodness, that, is that deep or what? Yes, that is. Blowing my mind. That's that is crazy. Deep. So they literally, um, so yeah, they, you were really firm about like, let's set the scene context. I think, quite honestly, it needs to have context because you need to know exactly. how significant it, it is, is that this guy gave his life up. Exactly. That was my or- argument because it makes you understand even more, appreciate what he, what he did after going during what he, what he went through. Yes, 100%. So uh, the hardest part for me, though, was I probably interviewed, the, he had 200 Marines in that company, uh, in, his, yes. in his company, and his platoon had 48 men at the start of the day, September 6th. At the end of the day, they only had eleven left. Uh, hold, hold up, during that the time that he died, yeah, 
they went from 40 to 11? 48 to 11 in the day. So that was just a terrible day all, all around. Into, I mean, literally 200 Marines walked into a meat grinder, 2,500 NBA. They walked into a meat grinder. Oh, that's all terrible. Reason, any of them survived at all because the NBA were coming across. And the NBA were, were sitting and waiting in a trap. The only reason any of them survived at all is because the NBA were coming across a large rice paddy. They were able to bring air power and artillery to bear. That's the only reason they survived that's, at all. Okay, so first, damn near 100% casualties, in other words. Oh, okay. When you're writing this stuff, and I, I ain't going to lie, like, I'm a big empath or empath or whatever. I you know, cried dude, many times. That's what I said. Was this junk depressing? Like, this sounds depressing I, as I've hell. I've met these guys and talked with these guys, and I've cried so many times. You'd be, I told my wife, you'd be inhuman if you didn't cry. You heard these stories. Yeah, because it sounds, like, absolutely horrible. His, comp, his platoon had 48 men to start of the day. At the end of the day, only 11 left. Of those 11, eight got purple hearts or gunshot shrapnel wounds. So they were somewhat hurt. Um, and they were shot, yeah. Out of the 11 were the uh, f- five guys, right? No, there were, there were eight left. Of the, le- of the 11 left, eight yeah. Eight got purple hearts. Means he got shot. No, I'm saying of the eleven left, uh, five of which were those guys. Well, a couple of those got wounded too. I'm, I'm, I say eleven left. The rest were either either killed or wounded seriously. We met evac out. Oh, okay, gotcha. So if you add the okay out of forty eight, right? Mm-hmm. How many were the the gentlemen that you're uh, that he saved? Um, several of them were shot multiple times. Jesus, they were shot too. Yeah, one of the guy, one of the five got shot. T- you know, at least two of them got shot twice. Oh my God! They still kept fighting because you had you, that oh or, Lord. you have no 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 choice. This is. I mean, they were coming. The NBA were coming at them in waves, just that's, waves. That they were cutting them terrible. down like waves. And they were coming, kept kept coming and kept okay. coming. Okay, yeah, it puts it in perspective. Man. So yes, that, you were shot. Tw- yes, you get shot twice, but you know I'm what are you gonna sure, do? I mean, your, one is your adrenaline is pumping, and you're just trying to live, right? You know, like fight or flight. You know, at yep. a certain point, I think that not saying they're inhuman, but like. I'm pretty sure, like, you just want to go home at a certain point. Like, you just want to do whatever it takes to go home. It was the hardest interviews I ever did in my life, though. Yes. I remember telling my wife, like, again, as a yes. sports writer and a journalist, I've interviewed yeah. thousands and thousands of professional athletes. Yes. Co- college athletes, celebrities, politicians, you name it. These are the hardest interviews I ever did in my life. Did they cry during the interviews? They did. Every I would, last one of them did. I would One of the guys, cry. platoon sergeant, I knew right away I needed to talk to the platoon sergeant and the platoon commander. Just, you need to know what... Strategic with it, what, they're, what they're trying to yeah. do, and so the platoon sergeant, he's the one who's living in Denmark. He's a millionaire, just had his fifth great grandchild. Wow. I hadn't heard back from him. I sent him two emails. I knew he was in Denmark, but somebody, one of the Marines, told me he was coming back to Michigan to visit family yeah. in uh, in um, Michigan. So I emailed him twice. Never heard back from him, and I wasn't going to push it because I figured it's yeah. probably really hard for him to talk boundaries. about. Yeah. And I'm not going to you're not going to press him on it. So I just figured I wouldn't hear from him. I, I did a statement that all, all the Marines made in the Medal of Honor investigation. So I figured yeah. I'd just use a statement. For a Medal of Honor investigation. All of a sudden, I got a phone call from him one night around 9 o'clock on a Saturday night. Never forget it. And he said, I picked up the phone, didn't recognize the number. He said, John, this is Sergeant Ron Posey. That was his name. He goes, I know you've been trying to reach me, but it just took me until just right now just to get the courage to call you. Oh, and I wow. told him in the email that the day was when he was coming, because somebody told me he was going to Macon. He finally got the courage of 45 years to go to Macon, Georgia, to go pay respect at the grave site of Sergeant Davis. Great. He's, at the, he's in Macon. Right. That's where if Sergeant he, Davis was born. Now, if he could have, you think he would have been in Arlington? I mean, he's an honor. The family he's wanted a, him to stay in, in Macon. He, he had, as a Medal of Honor recipient, he had always had, uh, yeah, the, option honor, he had the option. But, they but want the family him. wanted him close by. They want him home. Okay, right. got it. The family's very big, very important to them. Yes. And, uh, and so he called me. Is that you know? I told him the Davis family wanted to meet him, not to blame him, obviously, but to meet somebody who served with their son, their brother, their yeah. loved one. And he said it took him that long just to call me, and he couldn't bear the idea of facing the Davis family. He asked the next day. He told me he was in Macon. He'd already there. He asked the next day if I could come down and meet him by myself. And so I, you know, it was like ninety miles, eighty-five miles away, Macon, south of Atlanta. And so of course I drove, dropped what I was doing, drove down to Macon the next morning. He and his family went to the gravesite. I let them go by themselves. I knew it was going to be very emotional for him. I met him at a Barnes and Noble. And we talked for over four hours. He cried almost the entire four hours. I cried over half of it. Well, I would I would assume that that's uh, so much guilt there. Even survivor's you, guilt. Survivor's guilt. That's what you're saying. He'd been married for over forty years. He had adult, you know, adult kids, grandkids, and now he's got great grandkids. And he left Vietnam in early 60, April '68. He had never spoken with anybody, wife, sons, nobody about anything that happened in Vietnam, let alone that day. He held that in. He held it in. I was surprised. That's mental health. Three. Like, oh, what tax? How much did that take? A tax. Three on days your later, home? he's back in Denmark. I was back in Atlanta. I get this email and I just start tearing up. My wife's like, "What's wrong?" I just showed her the email. He sent me an email thanking me for allowing him to get that off his chest. He probably needed that. And I just can't imagine any man shouldering that burden for that long. I couldn't imagine either. And I think also I couldn't imagine that, like on the flip side, like think about that racially. Like he is. Not had ashamed, a great life, but he's not ashamed. But he's embarrassed to talk to a black family 
Like, think I would about say he was embarrassed. I mean, well, he's just, not embarrassed. He's just, just guilty. guilty. The, the, uh, he went on and had this guilt. great life. Yes, you know? and that, he had this great life, and he can't. You know, for him, it was a big deal. Not a yep. big deal, but it was a very hard thing to say. Yo, I really want to connect with his family, but I, I just can't bring myself That'd to be it. Very hard. That's a very powerful thing. And so we, I stayed in touch with him, and I of course told the Davis family that I met with him. I stayed in touch with him. We talked all the time, and finally, two years later, in 2012. We had him come down to a Deus family reunion. He was a guest of honor. He made it. That's great. And there were about 300 people at the, at the dinner. There wasn't a dry eye in the room. I cried like a baby. We but he also met the family. He did. And That's the sacrifice great. became real on both sides. He right. got to see, you know, Sergeant Tar- Tar- Davis' family that he he gave up. And Sergeant Davis got to see, you know, his, his family got to see the what tree. his sacrifice meant. The tree that it brought. Yep. Wow, that's really powerful, too. He's, yeah, like I said, he's got adult ki- two adult kids, grandkids, five great-grandkids, none of whom exist. Without Sergeant Davis Hack at that one moment. Oh, wow. That's crazy. That's nutty. So you got these stories. You got these. You got the things that you wanted to hold on to. You got it. Uh, you're almost at the end of the, the writer's journey. When did you know, after, uh, when you published this, what was that like when you said you finally hit, I mean, not saying digitally submit, but like it's real. It's in hard copy. What was some of your thoughts as soon as it became a real book? <laughs> Probably more relief, but uh, yeah. it, was, it had been such a, you know, one way it was, it was, I don't know, I wouldn't say anti-comatic, but you've been working yeah. toward this goal for so yeah. long. There's one mission, literally yeah. all my weekends, everything, just so driven and so focused on this one goal. So yeah. all of a sudden it's done. Yes. So like almost one way it leaves a little void for you, you know? What, right. You know? Because when was the start, the, the, the full uh, from conceptualizing this idea to publishing? 2010. What was, it was 2010 to 2010, 2010, what? yeah. So I finished it in 2007, uh, late 2017. It was so seven years. Yeah. It wasn't full time, but yeah, it was well, you a know what I mean? Like yeah. Seven times. I mean, that's yeah. a long time. It is. So when you did that, what was, uh, what was some of the, um, you got it off your chest, you got it in a, you got it in a hard copy. What was some of the uh, direct feedback you got? Like, it's been fantastic. Like, Absolutely maybe fantastic. Maybe as soon as you hit that, like someone said, yo, I thank you so much for yep. making this book. Like what I'm, was, and not, not now, let's not talk about now. Like, I'm talking about like, let's take us back to 2017. Yeah. What was some of the first, maybe first year or week of Well, the first feedback? thing I did before you went to press, yeah. I sent all the, com- the two combat chapters, I sent to the, all 50 Marines I interviewed. Okay. I, them. I wanted okay. them to read it. I wanted to make sure it was 100% accurate. Right. And I can't, because there's no way I was going to disrespect those guys yes. and get that wrong. Yes. Every detail had to be 100% right. And that took forever because, you know, so much time has gone by. Yeah. And then if I'm sitting beside you, if you're looking to your left, I'm looking to the right, and we're, you know, so our, our recollections of the, com- of, the, of the battle are going to be vastly different. Right. And so to take all that together and weave it back together, you know, the one guy will say, this will happen. The other guy will say, this will happen. And then you, you go back to the guy and say, well, this guy said this happened. And you're like, oh, yeah, I forgot. So right. then you got to go back and weave it all in, make sure the timeline is 100% accurate. It took forever. But I wanted those guys to read it, okay. to see the combat chapters. And I can't imagine for each of those veterans how hard it was to read that. Because that, that was one of the nastiest battles of the entire Vietnam War. Wow. And I can't imagine how hard it was. You buried all those emotions, those memories for so, you know, five decades. Yes. And to read that, read So these guys read that. They did. They read wow. it. Okay. And that was pretty. So what, after they read it, what was some, you got some emails back? Yeah, what did you get? They, they thought it was great. They really okay. appreciated me. And to almost each one of them says a man, almost each one of them said, this is, not, you know, this is Rodney was the Medal of Honor recipient, but his story is our story. Right. 100%. These guys, and every last, I'll tell people, anybody who listened, Rodney got the Medal of Honor, but every last one of those guys out there was a true hero. Yeah. Because they, they cowboyed the hell up. And that yeah. was, that was tough. And they got home. And they got home. All right, so you, that was some feedback. Now, what is one of the most unexpected? Now that it's completed, what is one of the most unexpected feedback that you've gotten? Um, like someone that came, like besides, okay, so besides the the, the gentlemen that live, they are like really appreciative. Uh, besides the actual people that you sent the copy, but who's like a random person that came out of left field? Colin like, Powell. He he came out of nowhere. Colin Powell. Told me he liked the book, and there's okay. no, that's ultimate well, stamp of approval there, right there. there. Go. Colin Powell, shout out to him. I, I'm good friends with former Deputy Secretary of State Richard Armitage. And okay. Richard, he's the one who helped me arrange the meeting at the Pentagon. Yes, and he's you know obviously was best friends with Colin Powell, and he asked me to give a signed copy of Secretary Powell, which I did. Okay, that's really dope. And when you get that kind of feedback from Colin Powell, you feel like you've done something. No, this, I, I'm like. That's pretty dope. So, what's some of the next steps for the book? Are you going? Is it an audio book already? Um, getting there. It's going to be going to be soon. But uh, on I, Audible. I, you know, I feel the, confident 
We'll get it in Hollywood eventually. Oh, that's what you want to do. Yeah. Who's going to be in like, mentally? Let's just play dream dream scenario. Who you want to play, <laughs> Sergeant Davis? I don't know. He was tall and thin, so that'd be somebody tall and thin. He was six uh-huh. to five, one hundred seventy four pounds. Six, now, six five. What? Yeah, six five, one hundred seventy four pounds. So it's got to be someone like in the NBA or something. Yeah. How, how about uh, how about? Uh, no, nah, I explain. I was about to say. Uh, the Greek freak, but then he had to like his <laughs> accent would be in that channel. I'm sorry, no, no shade. It to, wouldn't have to be the same eye, but you know, <laughs> yeah. you'd be, you had to be somebody along a long up physique, nine, you know. Yeah, and uh, man, wow, it was, it was, it's, it's tough. He's I mean, a tall it, marine. Yeah, he was tall. Jeez, don't they have like a height limit? Nope. Oh, they only have like a height limit for like the uh, subs navy, or no, the um height for the subs, and then also if you want to be the um the, the guy, the unknown soldier, those guys oh, that switch right, out, they have right. to be a certain height. Yeah, yeah. Because they have to look Six alike. Six two is a lot yeah. tall as you can be there. Yeah, exactly. But that's yeah. crazy. Wow, wow. So that would be the next steps, getting this out to a bigger audience. Yep, yep. Well, it's been great. The book sales have been going fantastic. So I, I could not be. Ha- the media's been coverage been great. I literally have had stories of me in the book probably. More than thirty different newspapers. So this is probably your like lowest uh, media outlet, my little <laughs> my little simple podcast. I love talking about the story, so you know I could talk about some all day. So I'm you're blue like, in the face. You're like, you're like I got big big news, big news, and your podcast. <laughs> 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 well, shout out, you probably my biggest guest then. I'll uh, say that right now. So we're at the point of my show. Uh, I don't know if you listened before. We call it shot for shot, meaning I get to ask you any random question, and you get to ask me any <laughs> random question. Technically, it's not shot for liquor. Shout out to Marty. He, he came up with this idea. Um, and just ask any question. Do you want to go first? I'll go first. You can go first. All right. So you are an athlete. You're tall. And you're a sports writer. Uh, and you've actually played with some NBA players, right? Plenty. Can you tell me f- – uh, I don't know if you can get to five. You probably get five. Can you tell me five NBA players that you played with, you know, yourself, you know, some just some street ball with – and tell me one thing that was hard about them, guarding them or something. Let's see. So five five players that you played against. In college, I played against Ralph Sampson. I played against Mike Miller. Okay. Jason Williams played at Florida. White Chocolate. Remember White Chocolate? Yeah, White Chocolate. I know about White uh, Chocolate. Who else? Donis Haslam. Yeah. Donis Hous- Hous- Haslam from uh, Miami? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay, you played against him. Okay. He, all, these guys are Florida Gators. Okay. So, um, back in the day when I used to cover the Gators, I used to play pickup with, with the Gators. Would you? Would you? What, okay, let's. Sometimes. Okay, so you named them. You named five. Did you feel like you kept up with them, or they? they, they I didn't them? embarrass myself. I could play back. Then. <laughs> yeah. I, I was, I was yeah. back before Asian injuries took their yeah, toll. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. And I was playing like five days a week back then too. Though. Okay, let me do my follow up question then. What's your style of play? Are you a banger and clanger, mm-hmm. a shooter? What you are? I, I'm, I'm very skilled. I can handle and shoot. You got handles and shoot. And how tall are you for the listeners? Six one. All right. So you got the hands. You used to be able to dunk two hands in the, back in the day. You used to be able to dunk. Okay. So that's a great question. Now your turn. You get to ask me anything. All right. Um, what would be your ulti- your dream interview? I already. Oh yeah. See, everyone says this. I already have it. It's my um. It's my uh, my trilogy or tri- trio. My favorite rappers. It's going to either be J Cole, Kendall Lamar, or Big Crit. And I would love to ask them. Not even rap questions just like life questions and how they come to their music uh particularly j cole and everyone knows this i'm a biggest j cole fan because he went to college you know i'm not saying he went to college he was just like if you see him or hang out with him he's just a normal dude that happens to be immensely talented at rap so i would just ask him like he went to college he went to st john's and you're like what do you study did you like college life you know stuff like that so i literally i keep on sometimes i randomly tag him and stuff on twitter <laughs> like maybe one day he'll <laughs> listen to this podcast but j cole j cole would be my number one oh, quite honestly like i'm already speaking into existence i'm gonna keep on tagging him until maybe someday he'll just randomly say like oh this dude positive leave me alone <laughs> yeah <laughs> uh, let's do this quick interview and get out my face it'll just be like 10 minutes of his time, but yeah, that'd be my number one. All right, well, I got another question. Okay. See, I'm a journalist. I, have, I, I can do Yeah, that you could do one question. <laughs> yeah, you could do another question. What advice would you give your 18 year old self right now? 18 year old self? Mm-hmm. Oh, man. And why? Okay, well, the listeners don't know, but my nickname was Ill Phil in high school. I think uh, Ill Phil because I was not the most serious kid. Um, I would tell myself be patient with uh, finding your skills. Like, Quite honestly, I thought, like, I knew I was always smart, and I always knew that, uh, you know, I maybe get a job that I like, but I just was never motivated by anything. Like, I like to talk to people, make friends. I didn't think those were skills. <laughs> like, making friends, I didn't, oh, that's not a, is that a skill? I just, that's how it is. 
Um, but now knowing and studying skills and being a career counselor, I realized that like the foundation, if I could have just like found a way to tap into my 18 self and say, you know, you like talking to people, you like studying history. Maybe I'd be a journalist. I don't know. I feel like this is fun. Like I love media exactly. and podcasts. And meet people. You're good and meet that. people. So I think I would tell my 18 year old self to like really investigate what do you like and what's fun. And also, I would tell myself to take school more seriously because, like, <laughs> like, like, I think I can apply to everybody. No, nah, I think it's going to apply to everybody. My grades was trash bags. <laughs> like, so I would just say, like, at least, at least graduate higher because I had to, like, really work hard. Like, I didn't even get into JMU, the school I wanted to. I got waitlisted because my grades was not that good. And, like, when I say not that good, it's not because I wasn't smart. Like, right. If I can go back in a time machine, I'm like, I like literally, it's not, it's a cake. I, w- I would tell myself that high school is not hard. High school is not hard. College is really not that hard, technically, if in my, my adult mindset. But, you know, college is hard about papers and balancing right. your life and all that stuff. But legit, high school, like, no matter what anyone says to you, high school is easy. Because, like, you got your class schedule. You know where you're going. Time, time management, like, technically, you go to class, class, class. I mean, like, legit, your life is set up. At 18. So I would tell myself, like, yeah, this is easy. The, the, this is the time where you're supposed to get, like, a 4.0. Go to college and struggle. <laughs> like, don't go to high school and struggle. Like, legit, like, this is where, you know, you did, you get busy work. Like, remember in high school, you just get, like, worksheets and stuff? I was like, yeah, you're never going to get worksheets again. I remember, you know, I was like, this is the easiest part. If I can go back in my brain and use what my brain is, I would tell myself, like, and I'm not saying, like, you know, this is, like, any parent. Like, I would just say, Try a little bit harder. I'm not gonna tell tell my 18 year old self you're gonna get straight A's. But I was like, yeah, you could, you definitely could get a three five. That's what I would say. Yeah, and cool. and also the the hobbies part. I would have joined back then if I could give myself a brain. I would probably join the school um, paper or the we had a radio station. And I did a couple when we had a what we call morning announcements. I only did it like once or twice. But if I could go back in the time machine, I probably would have joined it legitly and done morning announcements every day because I, <laughs> I found being on tv pretty fun right but i didn't really think i was good enough to do that all the time so i would tell myself join more rather than just play football and run track join some other stuff to learn being in front of the camera or learn the ins and outs of media because then i'm playing all this catch up now learning about you know podcasting and all that stuff it, i had all the tools right there for free like, right i would also tell my jmu self like go to this you know join the student media there too and do that jump while, yep. while all the all the the resources are on campus. Like do it while you don't have to pay for a computer. Just use their computer. And connections you make too. Yeah. Right so that's what I would have done. So we did a good question. I mean, you probably could ask me more questions to turn this to your podcast, but <laughs> the stage is yours. So this, this is the final segment of my podcast. We call it shout outs and plugs. You get to shout out anyone you want to shout out, you know, family, friends, anyone you want to shout out, and plugs, any ventures or anything, uh, plugs as in also where the listeners can find you, um, and make sure that, you know, all these things, the shout outs and plugs, or not the shout outs, but the plugs per se that you send to me, send to me in a follow, uh, in an email so that I could put the show notes so that the listeners that listen to this podcast can follow up with you. So the floor is yours, shout outs and plugs. Well, I, I just want to thank you, know, you. We talked about this journey uh, been on the last most of the last ten years. I just want to thank all the many amazing Marines and civilians alike I've met who have not only made helped make this possible, but have, have welcomed me with open arms the entire time. They were absolutely fantastic. I had some of the most amazing experiences which I will never forget, and it's helped me helped me in so many ways. Not just to produce a book, but for me the, the satisfaction and to bring that closure to my wife's family. Yes. You know, to provide them information they did not know. That has given me you know, more satisfaction than, uh, of anything I've ever done in my life, personally and professionally. And so for me, all those people, those Marines, civilians alike, people at Quantico, all the Marines from Vietnam, I thank them for welcoming me into their lives, uh, for allowing me to trust me with their stories. And um, there's so many times I, sh- I laugh with them over beers and pizza. I cried with them. And mm-hmm. it was just you never forget those experiences. This, 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 this journey has been the most amazing thing I've ever done in my life. I, quite honestly, I don't know <laughs> what I'm going to do to ever top this one. I mean, yeah. um, it's been incredible. Like, you know, I've met so many people. I've been to the White House a zillion times for various things. And my son has met President Obama. All this stuff has come up on this journey. It's, it's absolutely incredible. And I'll be forever thankful to everybody who was involved in it. Okay, so that's a great shout-out. So now some plugs. Where can people find you, find a book? 
uh, find you on social media if you want to share that. Like, where some where can the listeners yep. catch up with you? You can find my book. Uh, my, my name is John Hollis. You can find me on uh, Twitter, Facebook. Um, a um, little bit of everything. I mean, all yeah. over LinkedIn, whatever. Yeah. You can find the book, Sergeant Rodney E.M. Davis. You can go to Google. You can go to a- Sergeant Rodney E.M. Davis, The Making of a Hero. It's the, name of the book, full name of the book. You yeah. can go to the, the Hugo House website, publisher website. Okay. Or you can just Google it. You can you can find it on Amazon. Uh, go to Yahoo, anywhere. You'll see it everywhere. This, this book sales are going great. It, I can't couldn't be happier with things. So he's going. we're definitely going to send those links in the show notes so that you can follow up and purchase the book. But John, this has been great. This is probably one of my top podcasts. Hopefully, uh, you know, we, we do a follow-up or something maybe a year from down the line when I get to finally interview J. Cole <laughs> and my dreams come true, whatever, and we can discuss this. Or we can even just do a follow-up when this becomes a movie. I look forward to we're it. We're going to speak this into existence. It's probably going to be a movie. We'll Stop. get you in there as an extra somewhere. Sorry, I'm start. Sure. Oh, I'd love to just be in there in the background. <laughs> uh, maybe I could do a deaf I mean, no, that sounds really trashy but like you know <laughs> i just lay on the floor all my friends are already already clamoring they, w- they want to be one of the guys who gets you know gets 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 trash at the end no i don't want to do that okay <laughs> have me just at home like can i be in the making georgia scene where i'm just like at home chilling <laughs> yeah 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 just like at a restaurant in the background i love that so <laughs> yo and then i and then i would definitely get, use my um what's it called imdb credit say like extra number 100 there you go there i'll you be go. famous but thank you so much i mean i really appreciate you appreciate and i really you having me. Thank i you. really appreciate this this is a great great opportunity i think that everyone needs to follow up and read the book i need to get the book I'm, why am i faking i need to get the book myself <laughs> but i definitely enjoy this sir and i definitely want to get a copy of this book for my dad um because obviously as a a, a man in the military i think he would really appreciate this too so yep. thank you so much i and appreciate I, it phil thank I you i appreciate you thank you for listening to positive filter a podcast that focuses on family friends career with a little self-help along the way if you enjoyed this podcast Please share it with your family and friends and like the Facebook page, Spreading Positivity of Movement. Thanks for listening.